Okay, mamas, there is no getting around it. Mealtime is often the most stressful time for many families. Every mom that I talk to, at least in my own circles, says the same thing. The weight that we feel as often the primary caregivers to make sure that our kids have all the nutrition that they need or to even get them to eat the food that we serve in the first place. That can be so frustrating. So in today's episode, we are going to unpack several ways to support ourselves in preparing simple and healthy meals and snacks for our families, as well as how to intentionally involve our kids in that process. I'm Katie. I'm a mama, a coach, and a podcaster focused on supporting eco-minded mamas to live sustainably, saving thousands of dollars, and living a life that is in alignment with their core values as they care for their families and the earth. I'm here today with Julia, a mama of two and plant-based recipe creator over at the Power Plant blog. So let's get into it. Julia, will you share a bit about yourself and your story with us first? How did you get into all of this? Hi, Katie. (laughs) Um, (laughs) So I really got into this when I had my kids. I I was an omnivore before that and then a vegetarian for a bit. And I came across this book. I don't know, some of you might have heard of the China study. Yeah. Is, uh, quite an intense book. I'm not going to talk too much about it. <laughs> you can read it if you find find the time. But it just, it just shocked me beyond words what I kind of learned about diet and what we eat and what we get into our body with, with meat and dairy. And I basically more or less from one day to the next decided that this is not what I wanted to kind of having my life anymore and at this point my kids were probably about one I've got twins so Mm -hmm. they're they're the same age um so yeah it was a steep learning curve for sure because I got some quite uh I would say harsh critics it's maybe a bit exaggerated but people definitely met met this decision with skepticism Mm -hmm. um you know some said oh it's one thing if you do that for yourself it's not safe for children and so on and so forth I'm sure some of you would have have come across this as well Mm -hmm. so I made it my mission to learn everything there is to know about the plant-based kind of lifestyle and diet and what to look out for what to make sure that we get and and I just really just really became like my number one passion Mm -hmm. because you know as much as I love animals and it was an ethical decision as well obviously I would not use my children as guinea pigs so I wanted to make sure I do things properly And somehow I found that there weren't an awful lot of recipes out there that I thought were like nutritiously as sound and and as varied as I'd wanted them to be. Mm -hmm. So I started to create my own and eventually I thought, you know what, I could just post them. So almost to create my very own online recipe library for myself in a way. And then it just became quite popular and I really enjoyed it. And one thing led to the next and here we are. I love <laughs> that. And have never had meat in their lives or dairy and they're doing absolutely fine. And uh, <laughs> yeah, here we are. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. I think that's so great. And yeah, your your recipes online, I'll have all the resources linked below, but the the recipes online, your Instagram, you at least currently are always sharing like your lunch boxes for your kids every day. And it's just amazing to me, the variety that your kids eat, because how old are your twins again? You, you said you started this when they were one, but how old are they yeah, now? Yeah, around one. They're nine now. They're nine. nine. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So eight solid years of this. Yes. Nine. <laughs> and, and that's amazing that to me at that age, they are eating the rainbow, you know, you hear that phrase, like they're eating all the colors. It's so amazing to me. And I, I really want to pick your brain because even parents who might be listening to this podcast and are not really interested in being like fully plant-based or vegan or anything, they, they could probably relate to the struggle of just getting their kids to eat vegetables (laughs) at all, like any colors. So I would love to pick your brain. How did you get your kids like involved in this process with you like even being on board with what you're serving them I think obviously it helps when you start from such a young age because they simply don't know any any different now um but then I also get lots of comments on Instagram on on my lunch boxes for example people are really sweet and lovely but a lot of people say oh you're so lucky that your children eat this and it always makes me laugh a little bit because it was far from easy it still is far from easy you Mm -hmm. know like any child likes beige food um crisps and or chips in the states 
or any sort of nugget thing, whether or not it's meat in it or not. Beige food is very popular with children. Mm -hmm. um, and to get them to eat spinach and kale and all these kind of things, it's not it's not a walk in the park. There's absolutely <laughs> no way around it. <laughs> yeah. If they learn from a very early age to, to just try these things and to get used to the flavors and also to be told, obviously this gets a bit easier with age. You can tell them a bit more about it. You can tell them what it does to the body, etc. Mm -hmm. It's a bit harder when they're, when they're three years old and just picky and wanting to throw things on the floor. Um, <laughs> but I do believe that if you incorporate something over and over again, even if they really despise it to start with, they will eventually just think, you know what, it keeps appearing on my plate. It's, it, it's just something she does, something we have. It, it becomes a little bit of like a, a home comfort. It's like a flavor that you know, and it's just something that happens in your house. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure you have some memories of your childhood, like certain foods that you maybe you didn't love, but they just kept appearing on your plate. <laughs> and eventually just get on with it, don't you? You know, and if you're yeah. hungry, everything tastes good. So I think the more variety you can include from an early age, mm -hmm. even if it's small quantities, but just loads, loads of varieties, different different plants, um, whole grains, nuts, legumes, seeds, you know, all these things, obviously from the appropriate age. I used to pure everything when they were small. I was I was finding that easier. You know, some people go straight to um to finger foods, but with twins it was just a bit of a mess. <laughs> but then you can pure anything, though, and make it tasty and they'll eat it. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly when they actually see it as an actual vegetable, they start to be picky. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's no one said it was going to be easy, right. but I think it's worth it. And I think it's it really pays off down the line and it sets certain food patterns for life. I believe that also kids who know how to eat, I, I would say properly, you know, like from scratch, cooked from scratch, actual real food rather than ultra processed things and and ready meals and stuff like that. I think they will always have a tendency, even if they go for a bit of a phase during teenage years where they go to McDonald's or whatsoever, they will probably find their way back, I mm. think. Maybe that's wishful thinking, but I do think that if you know it from a young age, you will probably keep it up in one way or another for, for your life. Mm -hmm. That's what I hope for anyway. Yeah, and I think that what stands out to me about what you said is and this is something that resonates based on all of the the experts, like, you know, nutritional experts and pediatricians and everyone that I've been trying to learn from as a mom, because I do have a three-year-old right now. And I age, three years old. It's it hard. is hard. He hard. just is all of a sudden in this yeah. super picky phase. Yeah. And yeah, it wasn't always that way. But I think what you said about exposure, that's the key from what I keep hearing, at least just like. I love how you worded it, that it's about, you know, this is just something mom does. This is just something yeah. that we do in our home. This, you yeah. know, kale or whatever it is, just keep showing up on my plate because over and over and over, if it's there, even if they're not, you know, eating it and, and our job is to not force them to eat anything, but if it's there eventually, I mean, I talked to this one, um, Oh, what was she? She was some sort of a feeding therapist, like a swallowing specialist or something. She said that her daughter like would not touch asparagus, absolutely hated asparagus. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, one day when she was six years old, she just picked up a piece of asparagus because it was still on her plate consistently. And she yeah. just started eating it as if she had always been eating it. <laughs> like it can be frustrating as a mom as well, because you feel like you're pushing and pushing as in you 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 have to work so hard and then suddenly they make it so easy, you know, it can change from one day to the next as well. It's got so much to do with their mental develop development as well. I think a lot of the re refusal at three years, for example, is this sort of power game, isn't it? They're trying to gain some independence and not eating what you're told to eat is like the perfect moment to to kind of, you know, have a little strop and, 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 and try and fight mummy a bit. It's yeah. very unpleasant for us, unfortunately, but... <laughs> I think we yeah. all have to get through it. And I, I do also think maybe it's a bit old fashioned, but every now and again, it kind of pays off to just put your foot down a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, they try and it doesn't change with age, to be to be honest. It's just other things 
it's that constant kind of um, finding the balance between being super strict, but also obviously being understanding. And, you know, I do sort of give my kids two or three things that they can choose that they refuse to eat. Mm -hmm. One of my sons will not touch a banana over his dead body, never has done. (laughs) And I'm not forcing him to eat a banana. Um, I think it's bananas and avocados for him. Mm. Um, Maybe like a texture thing or something. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah. But as a, as a tennis player, I said, how can you, how can you even think about a tennis career without eating bananas? (laughs) (laughs) But I think, you know, we have to cut them some slack and give them some little, little bit of freedom where they can, where they feel like they have a bit of um, authority, I suppose, or, or Mm -hmm. um, freedom to choose what they want. But I can be a, a bit strict as well. That's for sure. I just think yeah. if you're hungry, anything will taste good, basically. That's how I was brought up. And that's one of the things that I think, essentially, I believe that's, that is true, right? We've all been mm-hmm. there. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, that kind of, you know, goes into my next question that I had for you, which was how do you approach, and you've touched on this a little bit now, but how do you approach introducing new and potentially suspicious foods to your children. Like they now at the age that they are, there's probably not a lot of foods that are new to them because you've been doing this for, you know, eight plus years, but maybe when they were younger, Mm -hmm. did you have any strategies that you found effective or ways that you talked about the foods that you're putting on their plate when they feel very like skeptical about it at first? Yeah, it's not easy that I think some things you can cheat a little bit. And for example, I I used to make a lot of mash out of absolutely everything. You know, you can put cauliflower, butter beans, you can make all colored mash. You know, you can Mm -hmm. make these orange mashes that are made of red lentils and sweet potatoes and carrots and butternut squash. And you can put whatever in there. So there's, but then obviously you're hiding things a little bit, which isn't necessarily what you want to do because you want them to know what they're eating and actually like it because of what it is. Right. Um, But when they're small, I always felt like this is quite a good way to kind of get them just used to the taste. And then you can say, you did actually have butternut squash yesterday and you enjoyed it. So why don't you try it roasted today? Mm -hmm. Um, Another thing I've always done is like if I have any greens, you know, sort of spinach or kale or or um, Swiss chard or anything, I just um, lightly fry it or or steam it. And then sometimes I blend it together with pesto. It can be like a store-bought vegan pesto. Oh, yeah. And you basically just sort of pimp your pesto. That's what I call it. <laughs> <laughs> and you can get quite a lot of greens into into some pesto. Yeah. I know. Some people may make just like a green sort of sauce you can mix with with your pasta. But for me, I think if I mix it with the, with pesto, then they'll have it. Mm. Um, pasta sauce is always a great, generally a great way. I mean, you can put so many different vegetables into a tomato sauce. Mm-hmm. Um, as long as they're cut quite small and you fry them a bit and season them nicely, add some lentils or some soya mints and they'll they'll eat it or in a lasagna same thing so you know you can cheat your way around it a little bit but eventually I think it's also helpful to just just tell them and say look this is this new thing like I made what was it Romanesco you know that sort of green looking broccoli slash cauliflower thing oh yeah yeah Mm -hmm. it's really beautiful it's a very beautiful vegetable vegetable and the, the boys were a bit like what is this I've not seen this this looks weird I said, look at it. Look how beautiful it is. Like <laughs> absolutely a piece of art. And we had a good look at it and they chopped it and then we sort of cooked it together. And and then they were interested to try it. Mm-hmm. So I think you have to make a bit of a a bit of a thing out of it. Mm-hmm. And yet still, they can still give you the whole, no, nah, no, nah, don't like it, don't want it, don't want to look at it. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it's, you know, there's no straightforward way. But um, I find that explaining things helps. Yeah. And yeah. And you send them with it and say, this is your plate and you have to eat it now. Oh, yeah. You know, you it's wanna... like when you do that and you're kind of digging your heels in, I think it just causes them to dig their heels in even more. And then it becomes this power Completely. struggle, which is benefiting Completely. nobody. Yeah. But but yeah, I I mean, I totally agree that I think 
getting your kids involved in the process of chopping or preparing or cooking the food, baking the food, however you can, at least in my experience, has totally upped the chance. <laughs> it yes. increases the chance yeah. that yeah. he will at least be open to trying it because he was involved in the process. So <laughs> what are some of the ways that that you often have your kids you know, involved. I mean, they're older now, so they could probably be very involved in the cooking process, but um, could you give like maybe a little recap of your journey through that? How did you involve them when they were younger and how involved are they now in creating the food that they eat? I would say I never involved them quite as much as I should have done, just mainly because of the incredible mess they create, <laughs> right? especially when they're younger. And it was just sometimes a bit overwhelming. I'm sure you know the feeling. Mm -hmm. um, now that they're older, they're a bit less bothered. But I, I always had them in the kitchen. We had this setup where they were eating in the kitchen and, and therefore they would they would watch me. And, you know, I would give them maybe like a peeler and let them peel a few things or stir some things when they were a bit bigger. Um, they do enjoy that very much. I should definitely do it more often. Quite often, I think us as moms, we just think, let's just get it done at, at the at the minimum time, <laughs> times yeah. of the essence. And as soon as you get the kids involved, as I'm sure you know, you're looking at um, a slightly bigger operation. <laughs> right. So, but I think it's the best way to include them for anyone who has the patience, get them in the kitchen mm -hmm. and, and let them, you know, let them help. I always let them help unpack the shop um they get very excited when we get our veg mm. box delivered on a Tuesday they just they it's, it's kind of <laughs> fascinating even for me at the age of nine they go to the front door and they check if it has arrived and when it you know they're like <laughs> Look at these beautiful apples I can't wait to eat one of those and it's Aww. really lovely I mean that might pass but at the moment the veg box is like a big thing but yeah, I mean, the more they are involved and the more they understand that, you know, a brown carrot is basically a carrot that's just been taken out of the of the soil and that's where it grows rather than on a supermarket shelf. Mm -hmm. um, that will help help them understand where the food comes from and uh, appreciate it. And uh, yeah, just just to make that sort of like a natural sort of process that you 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 wash vegetables and you peel them and you chop them and it takes some time and a bit of commitment but that's just something that happens mm -hmm. or you eat no like this whole idea of food preparation rather than just um pushing start button on the microwave right I think that's what was most or is most important to me I'm sure I, I could improve on in many ways but they understand that when mom's cooking, you know, <laughs> that's what's happening, basically. Yeah, it's so important. I mean, you're modeling for them the value that you place on their food and where it comes from. And the more hands on that they are, you know, pulling that brown carrot out of the bag, it's covered in soil, they have to go wash it off. That's, that's amazing. And not everybody has that experience. But I think if they can be involved in any way in just, you know, washing the produce or chopping it. Um, I think that it's important to get hands on with our food and understand where it comes from, especially mm -hmm. at a young age. And on your website and your Instagram, you have absolutely gorgeous recipes. There's so many that are on my list that I want to try. And I think as we bring this episode in for a close, I would love if you could just share with some parents, like what are some of your top tips or your go-to recipes for creating these like wholesome, you know, whole food based snacks or meals, you know, if it's um, something that's especially appealing to children, like maybe a good way to get in these veggies, or maybe it's just something that's really simple to prepare together. What would be a couple of your recommendations? For smaller children, I mean, my kids up to the age of about five, they pretty much lived on something I sort of invented that I called oat bar, which is basically I made a puree of whatever vegetables I had, mainly root vegetables and some lentils, mixed it with oats, mm -hmm. and then sort of spread it on a baking tray and baked it. And I learned, obviously, I sort of knew that, but I learned quickly that oats bind very well, and they turn almost anything into, into like a solid, half solid kind of bar kind of thing is mm -hmm. when you buy all these snacks that they, they mainly consist of either it's dates and nuts or it's something oat based no mm -hmm. so I started making these oat bars mainly savory because I feel like there's 
so many sweet options and actually it tastes all right you know obviously when they're very small you don't add much salt but later on you can season it a bit more and it's actually totally fine it's like a little meal on the go mm -hmm. um, you could get a ton of vegetables in your child this way and the oats which is great and you can make it sweet we can make it with apple puree or mango puree or eat bana mashed banana a bit of cinnamon you can add some nuts to it if you want like the list is endless mm -hmm. another thing i often do for um sort of sports competitions that they're both very much into sport is like i blend nuts and dried fruit you can literally buy a mix that's ready just you know like a nut and fruit mix that you like and just chuck it in the blender and it'll turn into a paste and you just roll it into little bowls and you're done um it's a great idea it's so simple and it'll save you some money as well and you can kind of just change the, the ratio ever so slightly because most of the store-bought ones at least here in the uk they're very heavy on the dried fruit side which is not wrong, but it's very, very sweet. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, the ones you make yourself, you can add some more nuts. And as long as it sticks, you can you can get away with anything. You can add some cocoa powder, make it a bit chocolatey or some almond essence and make it a bit sort of like marzipani kind of thing. Um, yeah. So I do that quite a lot. What else do I do? I do sometimes just boil potatoes and carrots and maybe some broccoli all in the same pan at mm -hmm. once. And just put that in a Tupperware and they can eat that as finger food basically it's 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 actually not as hard either or not as um time consuming as people think you just have to I think planning is key mm -hmm. planning is key and have some things frozen in the freezer I always have some um uh cooked beans and cooked uh grains you know some you have to soak overnight and then cook for a couple of hours and not everyone thinks about it the night before so you just make a whole big pan and then put a few Tupperwares in the freezer mm -hmm. and then you're ready to go. That's the mo most sort of um, labor intense part or time consuming part. I think the grains and the beans, obviously you can, you can buy them ready cooked as well. That's fine. And, and yeah, just, in, just, just enjoy, try to find some pleasure in the cook, in the process of cooking. I know we're all busy, mm -hmm. but I find, you know, you can listen to a podcast or you, you, you can, it's a bit of a, meditative kind of moment in a busy life where people run around it's just focusing on one thing it can be quite creative mm -hmm. and I think it's actually really quite therapeutic yeah I totally agree I love the time that I mean if I'm involving my three-year-old like you said it gets very messy it's yeah. much more hands-on less and, therapeutic and <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's more like guidance focused, but there is a huge benefit that comes from that experience. And then on the other hand, if he's not with me, that's still beneficial because then I do get that sort of therapeutic time. I love listening to podcasts while I'm prepping food. So yeah, this whole idea of, of planning and meal prep, I mean, that's another episode in itself, but I'm excited because you have joined the Eco-Minded Mama Collective recently. And so there's more information on that linked in the show notes, but that's basically our online membership program. We have a community of mamas coming together and supporting each other to live this out, to live all of these things out, all of the parts of living sustainably. And what does that mean? What can it look like from person to person? So we are very heavily going to unpack this idea of meal prepping and planning in the next unit that we're about to begin. So okay. if anyone is interested in joining that, I'll have that linked below. And then I'll also have all of Julia's information linked below. You should definitely check out her blog and her Instagram. Um, even if it's just to see on her Instagram, her daily lunchbox photos, like these great ideas of the variety that you can be serving your kids. Julia, thank you so much for taking time to share your expertise with us. I'm so, so glad that you're here and that you are creating what you're creating because it gives moms like me so much more inspiration to just try something new. Even if it's just once a week and that's all I have time for is to branch out and try something new like that. It's inspiring and motivating. So thank you. Thanks so much for having me. 